This is synchronicity. 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 Welcome to Synchronicity. My guest this week is Erica Dyke. Uh, we had an awesome conversation about, as you can tell from the titles, um, the whitewashing of women in psychedelics, and specifically how Saskatoon in Canada actually was kind of an epicenter for the original psychedelic research back in the 50s and 60s um, for a variety of reasons, which we get into, but how the women who were often critical components of this research have just completely been omitted from the history books. And uh, the reason I'm so interested in this is, <clears throat> if you've heard the earlier episode, I spoke about Michael Pollan's book being quite good, but one of my critiques of, what, of it was that he just really did not represent or do any type of exploration into women's role in psychedelics. And I think, as you'll hear in this episode, there's a lot of things that women can provide and bring, not that men can't, but that the balance of those energies and kind of perspectives can ultimately be much better for the overall kind of picture of what we're getting with psychedelics. Um, you know, I think Michael Pollan mentioned Maria Sabina, obviously the Mexican woman who uh, introduced Alan Wasson to um, uh, uh, psychedelic mushrooms and Kathleen McLean. But outside of that, really not too much focus on it. And I think it's very important, whether it's women, minorities, just underrepresented people in general, that we do shine lights on what they've contributed and what they continue to contribute to whatever we're interested in. Because it can be very easy to forget that uh, white men and white people in general uh, have been running things for a very long time. And that doesn't mean that other groups of people haven't been contributing. And in most cases, or a lot of cases, they've been exploited. So the the more we can do to kind of shed light on what the role of women um, and other uh, underrepresented elements of society have contributed is a is a very important thing to do. I also want to mention something that's going on, and you'll hear about all this in the episode. We get into eugenics that was going on in Canada, some really fucked up shit. Um, also, a something that's very close to my heart from people who know me, you know, mental illness, right? I, what is mental illness? How we classify these things is more ambiguous and probably less cohesive than people imagine. I mean, reality is something, right? We kind of cons have a consensus agreement on what constitutes normal and what constitutes not normal. And that is a slippery slope, right? Because if someone doesn't fit into the normal aspect of society, it is not a very far, it's a stone's throw from stripping them from kind of regular rights that other people enjoy. And we've seen this throughout history in many different permutations. So yeah, this conversation is is very fucking awesome, and I think you're going to enjoy it. I want to mention a new podcast that is coming to MindPod Network in the coming days. It's out now. You can go check it out. Mara James, M-A-U-R-A. -A. Mara James has a podcast called Unbroken Chain, and it is phenomenal. I've listened to every episode. There's seven, maybe eight by the time you'll hear this. And it really is an answer to my prayers. Uh, my friend Sean Dunn from Very Ape hit me up and was like, listen, Mara's, my friend Mara has this podcast. It's really good. It's like, all right, I'll check it out, Sean. And lo and behold, it is the answer to my prayers. Like I said, I've been looking for a show, for a podcast that is not only based and steeped in feminine wisdom, but and not only has a woman you know, running the show, but something that can balance out kind of the the more uh, make mindfulness aspects of spirituality. And I think the more I can do with MindPod Network and we can do to kind of make inroads into that kind of calcified uh, intersection of capitalism and spirituality, the better we're going to be for it. And that's exactly what Mara is doing. It is, I, I won't, I don't want to give it away, but I, it's just fucking incredible. 
truthfully. I haven't enjoyed a podcast this much, maybe ever. Truthfully, it's incredible. So that'll be up on MindPod Network soon, but go check it out on iTunes and other places. Unbroken Chain is the name of the show. Uh, I, this, this episode is brought to you by Sinus Infections. I, a month ago, said, went to the store, I said, hey, you got anything that's going to just make me feel like shit for a month? that it's just not going to go away and I'm not going to be able to sleep and I'm going to have to blow my nose all the time and I'm going to use the neti pot a million times. just have to take a thousand showers. Do you have anything that, like that that I can pick up, sir? And he was like, yeah, I got just the thing for you. It's called the sinus infection. So I took it home, started getting involved and yeah, man, holy shit. All of those things promised, guaranteed. Uh, it's been pretty much a nightmare, but I will say, um, I believe I'm coming out from the end of it at this point. It kind of was a gift. It made me reanalyze and kind of just put the focus on what I was putting into my body um, and how often I was putting things into my body. Um, And nothing really will do that quite like an illness to make you (laughs) reevaluate what the fuck you're doing. Um, But yeah, sinus infections. Thank you for supporting the show. Big sponsor. Love it. Uh, Now time for a real ad. Thank you to Meister, who is supporting the show. Go check out uh, their products at getmeister.com. 15% off at checkout when you use the code SYNC, S-Y-N-C. I'm getting a care package of some stuff uh, that I'm going to have some individual product reviews in the coming episodes, so stay tuned for that. This, This is my friend Davis. He's been on the show before doing some really cool stuff. Also has uh, a very cool kind of uh, project that you'll be hearing about that I'm involved with in the coming weeks. Uh, Okay, I think I've covered everything I need to cover. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Big thanks to Patrick Nemchek. Patreon, Patreon, I'm there, whatever. Blah, 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 blah. That's it. How about we just get to the episode? Without further ado, here is Erica Dyke. Erica, Hi. how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> Sorry to make you rush back to your office. Oh, no, no, that's all right. I knew it was going to be that way. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, uh, Want to just get started? Sure. Okay, cool. So uh, thank you for coming on. I uh, I actually got tuned into, I, th- I don't know who retweeted it, but I read um, the article that was uh, an interview with you basically talking about the whitewashing of women from psychedelic history, which I knew obviously happened, but didn't realize kind of the extent of women's role with some of the early psychedelic pioneers. And then I just kind of researched more of what you'd been studying. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun stuff to talk about here. So thanks again for doing this. Cool. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. Um, So I guess let's, let's start with LSD. Uh, in a clinical setting. And I, I heard, I think it was on Paul's third wave podcast, um, where you said kind of what got you interested in, you said it wasn't an interesting story. I actually found it pretty interesting, but <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what was kind of the, what did you find out when you started researching the history of LSD back pre kind of Timothy Leary, Leary like sixties explosion? What were some of the kind of the main takeaways you discovered? Yeah, I mean, I, as I probably said in the other one, I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but um, I started off because I was interested in why this windswept place on the Canadian prairies had, you know, become the the epicenter for this interesting medical research, and in a variety of different ways, in hmm. sort of public policy sides and health policy, in creating different approaches to publicly funded healthcare services. I was originally interested in why this particular place had become a hotbed of research in a variety of different areas, a lot of it relating to health care policy, but also different kinds of medical research. And it was in the context of looking for why kind of socialists were coming together with different kinds of research ideas. Mm. And within that context, I found this group of people who became dedicated to the work of psychedelic research. And of course, these were the people who also coined the word psychedelic. And so I was really interested in this period in the early 1950s that extended really into the mid 1960s. And it captured a kind of earlier, well, not quite generation, but an earlier phase, I suppose, of this exploratory research with hallucinogens, you know, before they had that word psychedelic to use. Right. And as they were trying to figure out 
what kinds of tools these were for understanding different levels of consciousness, for insights into mental disorders, to uh, chemically alter our perceptions so that we might trigger a kind of empathy. Hmm. And all of those kind of questions uh, started to really fascinate me, particularly as they worked in tandem with different ideas about how to deliver healthcare policy. Mm. So what was your kind of initial impression of LSD being used clinically? I, I, did you have either personal or anecdotal experience before that that kind of influenced your idea of what you would be studying? Or did you just kind of go in like, oh, what is this? Um, I, I wouldn't say that I was uh, naive enough. Like I, I'd heard of LSD before. <laughs> You know, I, I was familiar to some degree with it, but um, but it wasn't because it wasn't LSD that led me to this project. Right, right. It was really the politics that led me to LSD, mm. um, if that's a way of answering the question. Um, you know, I, I was born in the 1970s, so I grew up in a time when those "just say no" campaigns were in full <laughs> swing, um, and that was the kind of rhetoric that I grew up with, and certainly was part of my you know, health education, you know, in your gym classes and whatnot, we're, we're yeah. trained to see a frying egg in a pan, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's the context in which I grew up. That doesn't necessarily mean that's those uh, that reflects my beliefs, but but certainly it wasn't really an open culture for discussing these things as having any kind of real lasting value. And yeah. I always found it quite ironic um, my father's a farmer and, you know, we sort of had these parallel conversations about the way that we use chemicals to enhance productivity in food production and the way that we accept certain chemicals in our bodies to mm. change the way we think or the way we experience pain or whatnot. And yet other chemicals are considered, you know, a no-fly zone, you, new places where you, you're not allowed to talk about that. It's super taboo. And so that always kind of interested me, though, like how these things get decided, who with, whose interests are at heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I just, you know, in doing my cursory research of, of what you're studying, it seems like that's kind of a common theme through everything, whether it's kind of the eugenic stuff or the psychedelics or the reproductive rights, like there's, and, and what I found particular interesting, uh, psychiatry and kind of mental illness and how these things kind of intersect and how a lot of these policies aren't really developed with maybe the most altruistic intentions, but maybe there is some other element getting weaved in there. So in the early days of psychedelic research, what were what was going on? Well, you know, it's it's interesting and, and thank you for the question. I mean, I think that I think that in some ways they didn't really know what was going on. And, <laughs> and, you know, it's easier for me in hindsight to give some coherence to the work that they were doing because I have, you know, the luxury of, of looking back on this and also, you know, not too many people from that time speaking back to me and saying, no, that wasn't how it was. Right. Um, but I think that at the time, uh, despite really clear ideas about what they were hoping to achieve, I, it didn't really cohere naturally um, until much later. Hmm. So initially, people were, I mean, if I say initially, when I'm talking about the early researchers in Saskatchewan, at least, so 1951 was when they first got started. Hmm. Um, they were, there were two parts to that, I think. One is that they were curious about what these experiences helped them to understand. So really, self-experimentation was the right. driving force in the early days. And the second piece was they were quite um, aware of the relative research flexibility or freedoms that they had to explore things and to sort of challenge big ideas. Hmm. In some respects, they were given that as a mandate from the health reformers, uh, again, sort of on the political side of things, you know, what can you do? And it wasn't just carte blanche, but certainly um, they were encouraged to think about, you know, what are some creative ways? Like, how do we think outside the box, so to speak? Um, in terms of treatments for in the domain of mental health research, which of course had been stagnating for a long time right. and really wasn't going anywhere. So I think those things combined to allow them to have maybe uh, not just the creativity, but also the confidence to try new things. Mm -hmm. And that allowed them to, I think, I, that allowed them to really sustain the kind of research with 
psychedelics that maybe they wouldn't have done otherwise. Yeah, that's that's interesting to me that there was so much self-experimentation going on, which to us kind of, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later seems like, oh, well, that's not how you do a scientific experiment. But see, given that it was so novel and it was such a kind of explosive catalyst for the mind, it makes perfect sense that, you know, they would give it a shot. And then I can only imagine... <laughs> you know, how the research evolved because of that. And and, and it's very interesting because it's just, it's not how, at least in my understanding, clinical studies are done these days, right? You have someone administering these in a set and setting, you know, drawing on years of research, of course, but it's not like these people are, as far as I know, you know, uh, researchers aren't taking LSD with their patients when they're trying to get to the bottom of what's going on or before, at least not as part of the study. So that uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting. If we kind of, you know, if you think about this in a historically contextualized way, so we sort of flip the switch here a little bit. Now we think of it as being like probably unethical. Right? You know, we don't <laughs> take drugs with our patients, right? Or we don't even take medicines with our patients if we want to frame it in that way. Right. But if we if we kind of turn the clock back a little bit and we imagine what's going on in the 1950s. So 1952 is the first year in, in Europe, at least, and it's two years later in North America, that we get the first antipsychotic medication. Mm. And that really starts to turn the, the scales, I suppose, in terms of the um, the way that we are accepting psychopharmaceuticals into mm. that treatment space. So before that, you had people, you had other different treatment options. And we could argue that they were largely ineffective, but nonetheless, the treatment options available were were different, not drug related. Um, but there was psychoanalysis on the horizon and certainly right. in a way. And one of the ethical approaches uh, or the, the sort of moral or the ethical approach that was governed by the psychoanalysis was that you had to go through therapy first before you could provide. Therapy. Right, 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 right. So in that sense, it actually kind of fits the model. You know, it, even though we're adding a chemical substance now, the, much of the kind of mainstream research or mainstream therapies at the time, if we think about it in terms of psychoanalysis, required therapists to experience it first themselves. Yeah, that is a and very interesting And we kind of straight thing. that out now because that's kind of fallen by the wayside, but, but I think it actually kind of makes sense, you know, and it, it also allows us to imagine that this could have been considered ethical. Well, I mean, not only is it does it seem not unethical, it seems like for anyone who's taken a psychedelic, something you would hope someone had gone through before experimenting on other people or giving it in a therapeutic sense, because, you know, as opposed to something maybe like an antidepressant, if you're not depressed, you don't have any real need to take that LSD will have an impact on your consciousness regardless of where you are in the spectrum of mental wellness. So it does it does actually line up quite a bit. But I mean, obviously to us now, it, it feels like you're crossing a line there, that that's not something you're supposed to be doing. You're, you're supposed to be this distant kind of uh, applicant, uh, you know, applier of this stuff to other people. But that's that's fascinating that they were doing it. So like, what are the early, who are some of the early pioneers um, in Saskatchewan uh, for, for LSD research? Well, um, the, I guess the, the main guy who comes to mind is Humphrey Osmond. Hmm. He's of course the psychiatrist who coins the word psychedelic through his correspondence with Aldous Huxley. He had arrived in Saskatchewan in October of 1951 from England and he came over with his family um, or his wife, and then one child. He had two other children after that. Um, and they, uh, he became very quickly the superintendent of the largest provincial mental hospital in the region. Um, and he was there for 10 years. He worked very closely, of course, with staff in Weyburn, but also with a research psychiatrist in Saskatoon uh, named Abram Hoffer. Hoffer had grown up in Saskatchewan, had gone away to train and got a BA in agriculture before, or sorry, not a BA, a BSc <laughs> and a PhD in agriculture before he went into medical school and ultimately into psychiatry. He came back to Saskatchewan and really was interested in um, different kinds of, I mean, today we might say preventative approaches to mental mm. health, mm. Uh, nutritional approaches. He ends up getting even more, I think, I would argue he's even more well-known for hmm. the work that he did in orthomolecular psychiatry or vitamin-based therapies, hmm. which kind of is consistent. If you think about 
you know, the way that they were approaching psychedelics was something that you take once and uh, this gives you insight and it sets you on a path of recovery. Right. This was really attractive to a government that was also very keen on developing a system of healthcare that was financially feasible. <laughs> That's a lot cheaper than a lifetime of dependency on a particular psychoactive substance <laughs> or on long stay hospital care. What a novel idea. <laughs> yeah. But the vitamin therapies kind of fit into that model as well, because these were not patentable substances. They weren't going to make a lot of money. They're relatively accessible. People can take them on their own. It's not going to create a big financial burden for one to take to improve their nutrition, he argued, hmm. in order to prevent psychosis. And that so you, you sort of see these things working in tandem. And that kind of, I think, gives a bit of a flavor of the the I don't want to put too strong a point on it. It's not that they are all ideologically committed to the same goals necessarily. And yet I think they're very interested in the interface between um, sort of public health and clinical interventions. Well, it, it, what's interesting to me about it, it's kind of like the sane approach of Timothy Leary's idea of dosing everyone. You know, it's like the actually, if you were going to do that, it would probably be best to have some protocol that you could, you know, and a context and a set and setting where it could be useful for people rather than just putting in the water supply and freaking everyone out. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it's fascinating because like it, it to me, just I'm going to share a personal story here. I, I had a kind of break from reality uh, in 2003 and 2004. I took, I had taken LSD many times before, but I took it this one time and didn't end up stop tripping for about three months. It was a three month trip. There was no LSD obviously in my system that would have had that type of impact. It had long been released, but it shifted something in me where I was tripping for three months through the dreaming and waking state. It's why this podcast is called Synchronicity. Everything was a big synchronicity. But something that happened during that time period is people on the street, street people, would flock to me. I mean, it was the weirdest thing I think I've ever experienced just being out there, schizophrenic people, bipolar people, homeless people, people who didn't have kind of uh, an interfacing with regular consensus reality found me and I was able to have coherent conversations with schizophrenic people. It wasn't that we were talking, you know, about politics or anything like that, but I could see the threads that connected their seemingly disparate thoughts. So the idea of of finding something like a psychedelic to kind of give a window into the schizophrenic's mind, to me, is a fascinating kind of exercise and also would potentially have put kind of some of these early studies and researchers kind of on a an amazing platform to study this stuff rather than just looking at it like, hey, you're on this spectrum, you're crazy, we're going to treat you with this thing to kind of numb what's happening. Because to me, I, you know, it's not a maybe a popular opinion, but I think some of the clinical diagnoses we give for mental illness, you know, are about as close to a rough approximation as we can get with what we're using. So was there any kind of interface into looking at LSD related to mental illness rather than kind of a preventative, you know, we're going to do this for healthy people and, you know, try to solve, you know, whatever internal kind of complexes or issues that were going on? Was, was that something that was done? Absolutely. I mean, I think very quickly this translated from um, some degree of self-experimentation. And I say that perhaps I should clarify uh, some of the researchers took it only once. Mm. Um, some took it several times. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily something that people revisited frequently. Um, right, but right. <laughs> it, it was, they did definitely consider it a, a sort of window into psychosis. Yes. And some of them went in, in very specific directions. So um, Humphrey Osmond worked with a psychologist named Robert Summer, and they collected biographies that were written by people who had identified as schizophrenics or who had been labeled as schizophrenics. You know, there's some contention there. Hmm. And part of what they were very interested in, and a part of what I think kind of drove this program, was this desire to understand, for lack of a better way of putting it, empathy. Hmm. Hmm. The role that empathy plays in healing so in some ways in healing, uh, so making people feel better, but also healing in the sense that it might make people feel better to accept the way that they are. Uh. Not, not sort of fixing, but um, confronting differences, getting insight into differences. And so what you were relating in, in, your, in your experience is very much what 
many of the people felt was very was sort of critical for this exchange between a psychiatrist, for example, or a psychologist or a social worker or a psychiatric nurse or whomever, and the patient. In this case, they wanted to sort of flatten that hierarchical relationship, mm-hmm. generating empathy and helping to get insight into disordered or what had been considered disordered patterns of behavior and thinking. They also, I mean, this is, I think, critical. They, Humphrey Osmond, Abram Hoffer, and, and a variety of others, but they're sort of the leaders in this, they helped to co-found Schizophrenics Anonymous, mm. which is an organization that you sort of modeled itself in some respects on alcohol and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, which, as you, you may know, they, they don't say, you know, we're not alcoholics anymore, we're fixed. They say, right. we're alcoholics, we're going to help each other, you know, live a better life. And that's sort of the mantra of Schizophrenics Anonymous, too. It's like, yeah, okay, we are schizophrenic. We don't have schizophrenia. We are schizophrenic. It's part of who we are. How do we learn to live like this? How do we accept ourselves? You know, stop trying to, like the one I remember reading this at one point, someone was like, well, I can't cut off my arm and get rid of the schizophrenic. Right, right, right. I need to generate some insight into my disorder. I don't want to feel ostracized and alone. I want to connect with people. But the cues for connecting are sometimes quite different if you have disordered perceptions of personal space, of patterns of behavior, all sorts of things. But coming to some acknowledgement and and realization that, you know, that's actually okay. Yeah. And that, you know, that actually gave people a foundation for moving forward and finding a way to live their lives in a a more tolerant way, you know, or to tolerate and live with these. Right you know, uh, aberrations from mainstream. I mean, I'm I'm intentionally using weird language because it became kind of a self-actualization model and more about resurrecting autonomy for people than about fixing, healing, or rehabilitating, changing that. See, now this this is where I think this intersection of kind of women's role during this time really kind of merges with the function of the substance, which is this empathetic quality that kind of really, it it can evoke, it doesn't always evoke. But what was fascinating to me is when you were talking about some of the kind of, uh, you know, ignored aspects of women's role, it was it was amazing to me that, you know, a lot of these people when they were scientists, people early, you know, forerunners of psychedelic exploration, psychonauts, they were doing this with their wives, right? They they wanted a trusting and loving presence for them to experience kind of an altered state of consciousness. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what women's role were and kind of how that interfaced with the history of uh, psychedelic research? Yeah, I mean, I think similar to the way yeah, I was talking about where they got started, you know, it wasn't that they got a big grant and they went to the lab and they all, you know, <laughs> on white jackets and, you know, the, it's a different kind of scientific enterprise and not one that I think is, you know, less valuable or less important, but it was a different approach. And part of it was about kind of research inspiration as much as it was about mm. research. outcomes. And so to that extent, I think, you know, these sort of informal settings in which people took these had a lot to do with their, their deep curiosity about like, okay, things aren't working in this field. We need to do <laughs> Thing. They went to extreme lengths. And, and to be fair, I mean, we might think now that, you know, well, they were just having fun and this was all recreational. And there's no doubt that after some time and after some experience, there were elements of. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard. Yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, but I do think that certainly in some of those initial phases, and certainly when, you know, even after people had found that it was pleasant, the first time that people took LSD or masculine in these cases, most of them were quite apprehensive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most of them were quite nervous or anxious. And so you have these sort of dinner parties where, I mean, they're quite, it's interesting because on the one hand, it it looks recreational and and there's an element of that for sure. On the other side, they're quite careful and Mm -hmm. rigorous about the way that they take care of each other through these experiences. And that translates then later when they start to apply this in a clinical setting is, you know, Things like set and setting, Mm. Uh, you know, Timothy Leary becomes associated with it. But really, the language of set and setting was already published in the in the 1950s by Mm. some of the Saskatchewan group who were talking about the need to like we need to have comfortable spaces. You need to be able to, you know, um, if you want to have it inside, you want to make sure there's fresh air. You want to be able to go outside if you want. You want to have freedom of movement. Mm. Never want to be alone. 
it's best to have a trusted person in the room. And of course, for many people, that was their spouse. Mm. Um, and over time, I did find that, you know, after a few sessions, maybe, um, and again, some people only did it once, but for some who went on, on several sessions, uh, they would deviate from having their spouse there. They might do it with a colleague or, or right. in some cases like Duncan Blewett, a psychologist, um, was doing it in the therapy sessions as well with the client or patient. Um, yeah. but that, that's more rare than, than, um, common. It, what's interesting to me about psychedelic research and just the psychedelic scene in general is we know that women are a part of it. We know this. Anyone who has, has partaken, you know, studied the scene, we know they're there, but it's just, they're not prominently featured. Even I love Michael Pollan's book, the the, the latest one, but really the only person who gets a mention uh, extensively, there's two people, Maria Sabina and uh, Kathleen McLean. And yeah. meanwhile, this is this is a terrible injustice, not only for the fact that women are being kind of excluded from the conversation or being brought up, but because precisely when we're talking about the wives being there, the feminine presence and an altered state of consciousness for a male, for a kind of a machismo kind of ego state it is a necessary counterbalance. I mean, it is very easy to go off the rails if you just have a bunch of guys, you know, meatheads taking psychedelics. Watch what happens, yeah. you know? So it's just, it's something that, this is one of the reasons I really wanted to get you on here is because I think it's very important that we remember to include and acknowledge women's role in psychedelic research and just the psychedelic community in general. Because I think one of the things that blew my mind way back in the day, it wasn't, I think it was, it wasn't Arrow Wade, I think it was on Reddit, early days of Reddit, there was the Psychonauts subreddit. And I just remember going in there and it was just this massive argument about the nature of psychedelics and reality. And it was just people yelling at each other. And it was guys, it was just, you know, people who had gone on their own little ego trip. And I was blown away because to me, the psychedelic experience has always been such a unifying kind of, this is what it's about. We're all connected. There's more than what our limited perspectives are. But here are people who have taken God knows how many psychedelics and they're at each other's throats, ba arguing about the true nature of reality. And to me, yeah. that's, that's a major schism that basically has to be kind of closed and healed if we want to move forward with some of the real potential of these things. I mean, how do you see women's role, uh, women's role in the psychedelic research and just community right now? What's your take on that? It's a good question for a historian. I'm like always trying to look yeah. forward, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, okay, so I'll start with backwards. Um, it was, I, in some ways, it didn't surprise me that women's names were left off of papers historically. I mean, um, not not to excuse it or justify it, but you know, the, it wasn't unique to the psychedelic community for, right, for right. a stretch. Um, and yet, it is it's so interesting. I found you know, as I was interviewing people, you know, almost ten years ago now, in some cases, um, you know, in some instances, their wives were there, you know, here they were in their 80s or 90s, and they're talking to me and the, the wives are sharing some of their insights with me as well. And it was very clear from watching that interaction that these were partnerships, and mm -hmm. they had been partnerships in that moment as much as they were partners, you know, in into their retirement years. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that they kind of moved back and forth to help understand and describe the experience really struck me as having such deeply, they were sort of deeply committed to this, we might say today, gendered language, mm. whether it was describing things like empathy um, and the kind of language that was used to think about care and empathy. And again, this is a huge generalization that women just have these innate. <laughs> right, 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 in right of course. Um, but, you know, I think that I can get away with this talking about a kind of 1950s cultural mindset where I think some of those gender divisions might have been even more yes. rigid than yes. we experience today. And so it's jarring in the one sense. And in the other sense, it kind of is rather progressive. You know, you think about the role that these women played in helping to develop the language of psychedelics and the language of care. And and I think really, and I tried to drive at this in the article or in the interview a little bit. I think that the support of those wives, however it manifested, of course, it's a lot of idiosyncrasies here, but I think it allowed those husbands, we're talking a 
heteronormative world here <laughs> to feel more confident in their mm-hmm. explorations, in the way they talked about it. I mean, some of this stuff took them to places that weren't really part of a machismo language. Right. Right. You know, we're talking about, I mean, men I interviewed, it, most of the people who, well, I should say all of the people I interviewed who had been patients were men. Hmm. And in the sampling that I had access to at the time, and since that's, that's since grown, but in the sampling I had access to, it was a majority of men. Hmm. Um, so that's partly why this was the case. Almost every single one of those men openly wept, you know, and talked about, cheaply, they talked about their mothers. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that's partly influenced by the kind of Freudian language that was also in place. Yes, yes. Mother blaming, you know, I don't want to totally decontextualize it. But there was this really sort of tender relationship that people wanted to revisit. And it seemed that psychedelics in many instances took them to that place. Now, it's anecdotal. These were a few examples. But nonetheless, there was just a kind of reconciliation with the people in their lives, whether they were their wives, whether they were their mothers, family members, and a kind of recognition of relationship building that needed to occur in order for them to feel good about themselves, whether they were being treated for alcoholism or whether they were gaining insight into their other kinds of disorders. And it's not that those are female spaces. Um, However, I do think that the process of working through that on the other side, the sort of integration phase, if you will, had a lot to do with leaning on the women and other people in their lives as well, and men in their lives, I mean. Um, But women played such an important role in that integration phase. And yet the part that gets the sort of spark, the excitement, the papers, the, you know, the, the headlines is that interruption phase or that disruption moment right. and and a lot of the work of the integration fell to the women and so mm. I, I mean i think it's partly what we get excited about and you know it's harder to write a really exciting project about integration right? <laughs> yeah it's not sexy tell no. me what the dose was you know? <laughs> What did you see? You know, and and so I think it's partly human nature that we're sort of attracted to these these thing that things that appear quite dramatic. And it's not. And again, I don't want to overplay the fact that women weren't involved in that side either. But I think at least historically, we tended to sort of devalue this other part when we know from talking to the people who went through it that those were really incredibly important aspects of the overall experience. Yeah, I mean, those that's the transformative. That's the that support the women were providing there is really, I would argue, the point of doing a substance like LSD. I mean, it's wonderful to go and see all these things and have all these experiences, but if there's no practical benefit from it, it is. It's just purely recreational. So, and and I get it too. I mean, like, listen, no one wants to go hear about how they had this crazy ayahuasca ceremony and then now they're, you know, what's their main takeaway? Oh, everything is connected. I'm a better person now. That's boring. Yeah. They want to hear about the weird <laughs> lizard eagle you saw. So I yeah. get it, but it, it is kind of, it's a shame that that's not focused on more because that kind of, it, it, it ekes out kind of the role that these substances can potentially play um, as time goes on. I mean, what what speaking of that, what's kind of your prognosis of the current state of psychedelic uh, research? And I know I'm asking you to look forward again. I mean, <laughs> what, I'm sorry. What uh, what do you? I mean, what do you think is going to happen in the next five, ten, twenty years? Um, I mean, I I. I don't want to predict the future, but (laughs) I'm making you. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's a really interesting opportunity. Um, I think this current iteration of the so-called psychedelic renaissance is a really interesting opportunity for us. And I I hope us as a culture, um, I hope that we take that opportunity to look widely and think deeply Mm -hmm. about what this potentially means. And I'm, I'm not that interested in, you know, I'll, I'll be disappointed. I think if, you know, we, we get, um, you know, we're allowed to use LSD in treatments and that's the end of the story. Right. Uh, it just gets added to another list and it doesn't allow us to ask some deeper questions that I think is really in my mind at the heart of a psychedelic ethos or a psychedelic way of thinking, which is, I think to crack open some of these rigid boundaries that over the last 50 to 75 years have really hardened around our understanding of 
what constitutes health and wellness, what, Mm -hmm. you know, what is indeed pathological, what rights that conveys or confers, you know, to be deemed insane, certain rights removed from you. If we rethink what it means to be insane or, you know, and again, I'll flirt with this different language, but if we reopen those doors to madness or the doors of perception, if you want to borrow Huxley's phrase and think about that, we have an opportunity to do that. So on an intellectual level, I hope that it forces us to think through some of the diagnostic categories that we've set up, Mm. why Mm. we've set them and sort of the power that gets connected to them. Secondly, I hope, I don't know who's listening or who will ultimately listen and I feel (laughs) nervous, but (laughs) I hope that it also sort of in tandem with that helps us to generate some confidence as a culture or as a community to ask different questions about the financing of big pharma Mm -hmm. and our addiction to big pharma as a way to not only fix lives, but also to regulate lives. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that psychedelics offers a different model for imagining our connection to those experiences and, and, and maybe coming back to some of those historical ideas about questions about autonomy, Hmm. questions about, you know, when, when do I feel well and when do you feel well? And we may have different thresholds for wellness. Um, but what allows us to sort of be okay with ourselves? If, you know, that may sound a little bit flaky, but, um, I, I kind of hope that this iteration of the psychedelic Renaissance is bigger than the psychoactive substance itself, but allows yes. us about these things in a more philosophically, creative way which i i think was at the heart of some of of what some of people some people were talking about those things in the past too Mm -hmm. i don't want to suggest that's a new thing but i think it's an opportunity we we really i think become siloed in the way that we think about these different questions and we've got a financial and economics way of thinking about this we've got a scientific way of thinking with this and we've got the humanities over here and this and that I think we have an opportunity to put those things together mm-hmm. and think about the impact that psychedelics and psychopharmacology have on our modern culture. And I hope to be a bit more creative about it. I, I, I love <laughs> the way. You, <laughs> no, no. I love the way you said that. And it's been my general impression that that is the emerging theme, not just for psychedelics, but just everything. Stuff is coalescing. And it doesn't mean it's going to come together in some utopian dream of, you know, everyone's going to figure everything out and we're going to be great all the time. But it does provide that opportunity to at least examine the questions we're asking, like you're saying, and, and that idea of autonomy of, of what can you do and when can you do it you know, putting that back into the individual's or community's hands rather than kind of some lord over you saying, yeah, you got to do this is incredibly important. And I think, I mean, I'm sure you could probably speak to this too, that some of the, what made psychedelics so dangerous to the people in power back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, to, to the present day is that it does loosen those boundaries. I, I My first psychedelic experience was when I was 15 years old. I I mean, that's a weird time to do it. Your brain is still developing, but I absolutely describe it as until I did that, I was walking around with my head up my ass completely. I just thought I was the center of the universe. I thought everything was kind of here for me. This is how I lived. Yes, there's other people, but I, it's, I'm living the illusion of central position. And once that kind of gets shattered, that illusion, you really start to look at things in a different way. And if the system is kind of set up, to not have you question that, they become very dangerous substances that need to be regulated as Schedule One in this country, at least. So, uh, it's very, it's a very tricky situation because, as you know, like big pharma. I mean, Jesus. I mean, it's just, it's a very, very destructive force at this point. I mean, first they're going to get you hooked on something, then they're going to give you something to get off of it. It's very disturbing. I mean, I, I truly hope, like you, that. This, this renaissance that's happening right now, and it really is from, from underground to getting more kind of mainstream, um, really does provide that opportunity for people to kind of start asking these questions because, I mean, what, what could be more important as we're kind of facing kind of global crises? Like, you know, we don't want to be just saying the same things over and over again. That would be a travesty. Uh, yeah. And the other thing you mentioned that I really, it just, this has always been, I, I, I have a special place in my heart for people who study this or speak about it or have gone through the experience. 
kind of bringing yourself back from the brink of madness. Um, I, I was listening to an audio book by Ron Chernow, it's The Warburgs, about a Jewish German family. And one of the members of this family, they're a big banking family, was this guy, A.B. Warburg. And he essentially was this very brilliant, he was having these psychic premonitions. He put together this massive library, but he also went totally crazy. Like Freud saw him, Jung saw him, they said he was too far gone. But he did psychoanalysis, stayed in a sanatorium, I think, for like eight years, and then basically had to go through these battery of tests to prove that he was sane, and he was. And people were just blown away that someone who had been so far gone from consensus reality was able to not only intellectually analyze his illness, his mental illness, in quotes, while he was going through it, but had the wherewithal to kind of pull himself back from it. Because those, I feel like if we start paying attention to those examples and situations, we do get kind of a new lens to look through some of these like clinical diagnoses, you know, the spectrum of mental illness, which to me has always felt kind of, like I said, a rough approximation. We're viewing symptoms, but we're not really sure what's going on there. And the ability for psychedelics to kind of you know, uh, make inroads to that specific area, I think is just one of the most powerful things about it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's exciting to imagine an experience that allows us to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And instead of taking that vulnerability and exploiting it, you know, taking that vulnerability and making it productive, mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of feeding, feeding back into the system with that, you know, and, and I, I, whether it's vulnerability or empathy, I think these are important qualities to bring into this conversation. And, uh, it, and I'm excited in, in many respects for for the ways in which they they might begin mm -hmm. to help us think through some of these, you know, we've, we've kind of got ourselves in a bit of a cul-de-sac or, um, you know, into a, a bit of an entanglement when we think about the like ballooning costs of healthcare, <laughs> when we think about, you know, the addiction to big pharma, whatever it might be, right? And, and it does seem, I mean, it's not coincidental, I don't think that we, uh, we first invested, we, I just mean that generically, <laughs> Yeah. Right? We, um, you know, psychedelics first made their, you know, sort of a, a critical appearance in Western science. This is not to discount earlier iterations, but um, if we think about the 1950s and 60s, in terms of the history of psychiatry and mental health, you know, that was right at the time that we were also like, you know, we've done this locking people up for 100 years, uh, locking people up for their lives over mm. the past century in mental hospitals. And we were just at the cusp of trying to overturn that system or that paradigm even. And it seems that that was eclipsed or overturned in some ways by pharmaceutical remedies. Yeah, yeah. And we've had about 70 years now of experience with pharmaceutical remedies. And what we see is that the rates of mental illness are going up. Yeah, skyrocketing, right? I mean, it's... Yeah. <laughs> so, so we've actually... We've just like changed the language that we use and the lens perhaps that we use to describe and capture this population. Um, and we haven't actually made any inroads to feeling better about, you know, fixing, healing, feeling better about who we are in the first place, any of those kinds of things. Right. So it does seem that we need a sort of break in the way that we conceptualize, which is not going to come from a new drug. Right. Right. You know, or like patenting a new drug. Right. <laughs> There's no it, soma that we're going to be giving to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is why I'm kind of, you know, I'm excited about the opportunity that this experience allows us to have. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I share your excitement and I, I am a very optimistic person by nature, but I also recognize the very steep hill that needs to be kind of climbed and hopefully it's not Sisyphusian. Because there's just so much stacked up. I mean, especially in the United States here. I mean, it is just absurd how out of whack and how to out of touch people are just not only to their own lives, but just the role of pharmaceuticals is just out of control. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's, it's shocking to me that, you know, this is a problem that isn't on everyone's mind just because everyone knows someone on some type of medication that's a prescription medication, period. Like, I, I don't know, unless you just only know really young and healthy people, that's just not how things are treated. And, um, and even that, you're probably still on medication. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm shocked whenever I, I get to talking with someone and they're candid about it when they tell me they're on an SSRI or some other type of antidepressant. And I'm just like, 
you know, I, I don't say, oh, you shouldn't be on. That's not my role, whatever. But just the prevalency of it is just, it's, it's astounding. And if we do have any other tools at our disposal, um, whether done kind of from a clinical and an above board sense, so to speak, or just kind of the underground that's forming for a lot of these healings. I mean, I think that really is kind of like, we have to take that opportunity and run with it and be excited about it. Because if we're not, I mean, I, like you said, I, I don't think they're going to invent some pill that's going to solve everyone's problem. I'm not holding my breath on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Well, so I, I also wanted to touch on just a little bit because I, as I was doing research, I, I think it's a fascinating topic too. Before we go, could I, not to like leave on this, but your book, Facing Eugenics, I, I am not abundantly familiar with what was going on in Alberta. Um, could you just provide some insight um, on that? Because I, I this is a very interesting topic. Sure. Uh, yeah, so the book kind of grew out of a, of a project that I was working on with um, survivors of the eugenics program in Alberta. Uh, so people who've been sterilized without their consent mm. or knowledge in many cases. Um, and the, the sort of, I'll just give you a couple of sort of bare bones, general things. Mm. Um, Alberta was one of two provinces in Canada that had a sterilization policy in place under kind of a eugenics program. It was put into place in 1928 it was um, overturned in 1972, so quite a long period. Throughout the course of the program, uh, there were a little close to 4,000 people who were recommended for sterilization, and just under 3,000 people were ultimately sterilized. Well, what was the rationale for this? Well, it changed a few times in <laughs> that sort of policy language, um, but the overarching sort of guiding principles, if you will, were targeting people who were institutionalized in, um, in facilities that are, what, whatever, mental hospitals and mm. uh, training schools. So mm. uh, institutions for people who were considered then feebly, feeble-minded, yeah. um, which was often determined by, like, ostensibly by an IQ test. Oh, Jesus. Um, but really, in practice, what this meant was that you had a number of people, very vulnerable people, um, some of these kids had never lived in a family setting. Some of them had been, you know, orphaned for a long time. So whether or not they actually had low IQs, um, problematic as those tests are, there's actually kind of a chronic institutional care situation as well. Mm -hmm. And there was an assumption that a this was causing, um, well, there was it was um, creating a lot of financial dependency mm -hmm. on these large scale institutions. And if you could get rid of the next generation of dependents. And some of that language was pretty blunt. Um, so unlike some jurisdictions, if we naturally think of Nazi Germany right. Right. targeting you know, Jewish populations, but also, I mean, the first policy in Nazi Germany, which was in place in 1933, uh, focused on people in mental hospitals mm -hmm. and in sort of mental hygiene clinics, or again, sort of this, this sort of malaise of language describing inferior intellect, inferior intelligence, right. physical and mental disabilities. The language changes over time, of course, but really targeting people who we don't think fit along these lines of mental ability. Mm. Now, of course, that gets grafted onto races and genders in different ways as well. In Alberta, what I found um, and what others have found is that the sort of target populations, if you will, no, no population was described in the lay in the policy is like we are against ukrainians or something <laughs> right but ukrainians were disproportionately represented wow we also found that um indigenous people were underrepresented in some respects early on and by the end of the program they are vastly overrepresented in the targeted populations alberta is interesting and unique in one respect in that they had consent laws in place initially and they removed the need for informed consent in 1937. <laughs> Even Germany didn't do that. <laughs> and the argument was that they were they were sterilizing people who were they considered to be incompetent and therefore incapable of oh, giving okay. consent. And so what what happened is there was a court case in 1995 six um, where one woman successfully sued the provincial government. Uh, this Lilani Muir was her name. Um, and in the wake of that finding, where it, tur it turned out that actually her IQ test had been added up incorrectly, <sighs> even based on their own logic, Jesus. she had been sterilized. 
Um, in the wake of that finding, there was a class action suit forming and it was settled out of court. So that's been kind of silenced. Um, but there was this sort of opportunity in, in some respects for people like myself, historians, but other scholars, legal scholars, sociologists, community activists, to start to work with that group because this history has kind of been written out of the history books. I've know, never like, heard of this. So that's why I asked. Yeah. Exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. We're done here. You know, we're better now. We don't do that anymore. And we thought, you know, there's a lot of community frustration about the ways in which human rights have been really trampled on, particularly, and, and again, from where I'm coming from, particularly when things like competence, intelligence, right. intellect, ability are called into question. And so in response to that, we, we tried to work together with the community to help people put together um, some history of this so that people can be aware of it. We helped, we went to schools and we did some curriculum development to try to bring awareness to the ways in which people were treated and, and to help to ask questions about, you know, some of the lingering after effects. We don't have the policies in place anymore, but we know that, you know, children are still apprehended in different systems. We know that there are certain challenges to raising children in these environments. And, and again, so sort of thinking about this along the lines of human rights mm. and, uh, and the ways in which psychiatry and not just to beat up on psychiatrists, but the ways in which we kind of accept these classification systems yes. and that translates into a kind of political power or access to political power that is not evenly distributed. And we certainly know that it is not necessarily borne out in the reality of people's lives. Ugh, I mean, that is Sorry, I got another soapbox. <laughs> no, I, I mean, again, like that, it's, it's eloquently said, I, I obviously had no idea about that. I, I, I my family is of Ukrainian descent back in the generation. So <laughs> my ancestors are fuming right now. I mean, that's, that's truly fascinating. And I think, again, the theme that I see in a lot of your different research and kind of looking back is a shedding light on stuff that happened, but also this kind of this theme of healing, right? This, this idea of like, if we're going to look at this stuff, can we continue to carry and bear witness with this as we move forward? Because just forgetting about it, I mean, that's, if you want to look for an example of how, what happens, look at Donald Trump. If you just want to pretend shit isn't happening, you're going to end up with someone like that. And no one wants that. Um, yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's not true. But most people, <laughs> let's say a lot of people don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, but wow, I mean, that is, that is mind blowing. I mean, of course, using, I've always found Listen, I've had good psychiatrists. I, I don't see one now, but when I was had my little, you know, break from reality, I got diagnosed with bipolar at the time. Got prescribed lithium by a very nice psychiatrist. Eventually came off of it because I, I realized I didn't need it. So I, I don't. I'm not anti psychiatry, um, mm -hmm. but it is used as a cudgel a lot to just yeah. completely. I mean, it's one of the easiest tools to use if you say this person is certifiable, they're insane, you've just stripped them from so many human rights and civil rights that it's hard to imagine for most people because you're you're literally branded as someone who, like you said, I mean, there's th the idea that they're taking away the consent because they're deemed that they can't have consent. I mean, that's the slipperiest of slopes for everything. I mean, that's 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 truly truly nuts. I mean, what has kind of been the uh, the coda to that? I mean, what's going on now? Was there any resolution? Do more people know about this? I mean, uh, well, in terms of resolution, I'd say it's very vague. Mm. Um, there, there, you know, there was an out of court settlement, so there was a, a monetary settlement for some of the people. As as I understand, it was pretty paltry. Mm -hmm. um, con and not only just considering, you know, how do you put a price on <laughs> you know, one's ability to reproduce. I don't know. I'm not even going to pretend to weigh into that. Um, but, um, but I mean, there are a lot of legal fees and really, and what this came with was also a promise that this was not supposed to be something that was raised in public discourse again, mm. which of course we, at least, um, you know, those of us who are in the privileged position to be able to fight against that, uh, which is not everybody. Right. Right. Uh, we were outraged with this and so trying to sort of crack that and of course it's it's kind of ridiculous i mean you can't really do that um but this this sort of engagement in what we described as the politics of forgetting and the politics mm -hmm. of this whitewashing mm -hmm. was so damaging i think um you know not remembering this past not just for history's sake but as you say i mean 
This is so important for the ways in which we try to understand and untangle these issues today. They're not over. Right. I mean, of course, you know, reproduction, as as I understand it, continues to be <laughs> a pretty hot issue. Yeah, people people are you pretty. Know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I, it's, yes. it's been a it's been really interesting um, sort of wading through some of these things, and it and I guess it's is demoralizing in some respects um, that some of these issues that were alive and animated, you know, before Nazi Germany um, are still alive and yeah. animated. And we sort of, we, we tend to, it seems, um, or there are instances in which you can see uh, attempts to say, well, you know, but, but we weren't that bad or <laughs> we're better now or something. And I, right. I think it's actually quite a dangerous position to come yes. from. And, and again, I mean, I am a historian, so I'm, you know, that it is my nature to to want to look back. Um, but I think it's really important to be able to have some of that foundation and and not not to you know lay out the facts necessarily, but but to appreciate and get that insight into how these things have translated into, you know, our, our understandings about whose lives have value or mm. whose thoughts have value, and you know, and and I, in my mind, that's kind of where the psychedelics come in as well because I'm very interested in these questions of power and autonomy, hmm. they, they come together very, very naturally in my mind. You know, the ways that we make assumptions about, you know, who can contribute or whether their contributions are valid or good or, um, you know, in very yeah. generic sense. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it, they're completely connected. And, and I mean, to speak to the point, I mean, if, if uh, I'm a big Carl Jung fan, I mean, if you, if you don't face your shadow collectively or individually, it's going to haunt you the rest of your life. I mean, it's just, it does not go away. You can repress, repress, ignore, ignore, but that's not, it doesn't really deal with anything. Eventually, you're going to sweep everything under the rug and you're going to have a big old lump under your rug and it's going to look weird. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, it's interesting because, you know, I was, when I was learning about you and, and seeing kind of these seemingly disparate I, you know, areas of research, they, they very much are connected. And I, and I do get the sense that that idea of autonomy or just freedom, right? The ability to choose what is happening. And then also how that, how that relate, how you can relate that to other people, right? I mean, it's not just we're these islands making our own decisions that don't have an impact on anyone else. These things come together in a very real and kind of substantial way. It's, it's really, I just think what you're doing is very cool is what I'm basically saying. Nice. <laughs> It really is. Well, I, I, I wrap up with um, three quick questions and then one kind of open-ended one. So we'll do that. They may seem silly, but they're very important. Uh, <laughs> what is your favorite color? I'm going to say blue today. Cool. <laughs> what is your favorite number? Nine. Good one. What I'm is... Sorry. It's been my number for like 20 years. <laughs> That's a great number. Uh, what is very mystical number? What is your favorite animal? Hmm. Favorite animal. That's a good question. <laughs> I do not know. Uh, my favorite animal. I'm going to say a rabbit. Ooh, I think, you know, you might be the first person out of like 150 something to say rabbit. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then last question. What's a practical tip that's helped you in your life that you could share with people who are listening? Could be anything. Uh, listen to lots of people. Mm. Perspective. Good to have as much <laughs> as possible. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I had a great time, Erica. Thank you so much for coming on so quickly. I, I Again, I'm going to direct people to go check out what you're doing and, and what you've written just because uh, these issues are really, really important and I don't think we hear about them enough. So just thanks. Thanks a ton. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure and uh, it's been fun chatting with you. Awesome. Speak soon. All right. Thanks, Erica. Right. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye, Noah.
enjoyed that episode. I know I did. Uh, Erica, go check her out online. She's interviewed uh, specifically about the the whitewashing of women. You can just Google that and you'll find it. I think it was with Chakruna, if I'm not mistaken. She also has, uh, she's it was edited, she has a book she was part of um, coming out in December 2018 called Psychedelic Prophets, The Letters of Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond. And Humphrey Osmond, as you heard in this episode, was one of the people who was involved with early psychedelic research. I'm really excited for this. Apparently, there's a lot of young stuff and uh, LSD conversations, mescalines, uh, mescaline conversations. So I'm really excited for that. I believe it's on McGill Queens University Press in Canada. Like I said, 2018, December, coming out. Go check it out. Uh, I hope you like this episode, as I mentioned before. Uh, subscribe, rate, review positively on iTunes. I don't know. Go do that. I like it. Makes me feel good. Probably make you feel good, too. Uh, so that's it, and I will see you next week.